Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Catherine for the um, invitation. Um, I uh, will begin also with some disclaimers and a couple of definitions. Um, first of all, there will be no coherence in this talk. Uh, there's going to be some stops and starts uh, and shifts uh, along the way. I'll try to make some uh, 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 attempts at, at uh, transitions, but uh, they may not be successful. Uh, this will not be a polished talk uh, by any means. It's going to be very informal. Uh, there's going to be little rigor in this talk. Uh, it really lacks close argument. Um, we don't really have much time for that, I don't think. Um, and <clears throat> even though my wife, Shayi, is here, and we've been happily married for almost 20 years, I will not be talking about how our marriage has anything to do with um, conflict resolution uh, at all. Um, the title, How Beauty Can Save Us, I should also say, is not like 100% meant sincerely. Um, I'm aware of the difficulties uh, involved in being saved by anything or anyone, uh, not to mention how beauty can save us. Uh, but I just put it out there as kind of cheap advertising and, and, and kind of mock uh, redemptive language at the same time. But, uh, you know, that's not to say I don't believe in the possibilities, uh, at least, uh, but a lot has to change for beauty to really play an important role in conflict resolution in our society. Yes, sir. A quick note, Dorothy Day used to say that, uh -huh. that beauty will save us. Oh, did she? Yeah. Okay, I'll have I to, believe, I believe that's right. I'll have to investigate that. I was not aware of that. Um, so, um, a few uh, attempts at uh, definition, uh, beauty. What do I mean by beauty? I mean the qualities in a person or an object. Object can be man-made or natural that give pleasure to the senses. Uh, very, very straightforward, very basic. Uh, beauty is only one aspect of aesthetic experience, which is much, much broader. Um, <clears throat> it's distinct from the sublime, uh, which I won't get into here. It's obviously distinct from the ugly as well. Um, and uh, in fact, beauty itself has an ugly side. Uh, beauty can be uh, used to oppress, to humiliate, um, uh, to kill. Um, a few examples would be um, Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye, uh, in which a young woman uh, actually commits suicide because of society's understanding of her own lack of beauty, which she internalizes. And of course, many of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Theodore Adorno's famous um, statement after the Holocaust that to write poetry uh, after the Holocaust is barbaric. Uh, great skepticism about the role of beauty uh, in the wake of catastrophe and how it might be appropriated or misappropriated really to represent, falsely represent uh, that, that disaster. Uh, so I'm aware of all of the difficulties in talking about uh, beauty, but I just wanted to lay them out here so we can uh, keep them in mind. Uh, again, I'm a humanist. Uh, I've not really uh, uh, spoken uh, to an audience like this before, so I will make some efforts to, uh, to make some connections. Um, uh, one way I'm going to be doing it is I'm going to be talking a little bit about John Rawls, and I was kind of hoping that at least some of you would be familiar with John Rawls. Nobody in literary studies is familiar with John Rawls, uh, but I was just kind of assuming that at least some folks in Maxwell would be. So I'm going to make a connection to, uh, to, to Rawls. Okay, so now all the pressure is off. <laughs> all right, uh, I can screw up as much as I want. <laughs> All right, I want to begin uh, with a speech that W.E.B. Du Bois gave uh, to the NAACP uh, in 1926. Um, this was an audience of activists, and the title of his talk was Criteria of Negro Art. Um, and he observed at the outset that this group of activists were uh, uh, apparently a, a, a bit disturbed about about the topic, about the subject. Um, so uh, half of them considered discussing beauty to be irrelevant, to be a distraction for, quote, a fighting organization which has come up out of the blood and dust of battle. 
And indeed, you know, I think that's a fair characterization of the NAACP in its earlier decades. It was fighting for equality. It was fighting against lynching. Um, these were really difficult struggles and dangerous struggles as well. The other half of his audience, he speculated, uh, were saying to themselves, oh, okay, let's take time out to talk about beauty. It's nice to dream. And besides, it'll leave a nice little taste in, uh, in the mouth. And um, his response was to really kind of refute both reactions uh, by arguing that this is a group that has been climbing mountains. Um, they have been gaining some attitude altitude, excuse me, and they're at a point now where they can sort of look around and gain some sort of panoramic view of where they've been and where they might be going. And Du Bois argued that art and beauty are absolutely essential to understanding where this movement is going, what are its goals, what is its understanding of the quality of life that it wants for its people. Um, and he went on and talked about emblems of beauty that might inform uh, the goals of this political organization. And, you know, I, I, it, it's always been a very powerful essay for me. Uh, I myself was part of uh, uh, an activist organization uh, in, in the one I was in. There was really very little vision of the future. Uh, it was really all about expediency and about winning struggles and the future and goals and ends uh, were often sacrificed uh, to those immediate uh, struggles and tactics. And I found that eventually learned uh, that that's an extremely dangerous uh, uh, kind of movement to, to be part of and to be dealing with. So in that broad sense, I think art and beauty play a very important role in understanding uh, political struggle and uh, building political organizations. In fact, I, I like to reverse the question. Uh, typically, political organizations ask of its artists and writers who might be affiliated or simply sympathetic, how have you contributed to the movement? You know, does your work further our goals? Um, and I think the more important question is to interrogate the movement and ask the movement, what have you done for your writers and artists lately? How do you support them? And therefore, how do you support the humanity uh, of the relations that exist within your organization and the humanity of the society uh, or the policies that you, uh, you are supporting? Um, so this essay um, was confirmed for me uh, many, many years ago when um, I uh, came across an article about uh, Gus Newport. Gus Newport is an inner city activist. He was the former mayor of Berkeley, California, and he's been involved in, um, uh, again, inner city struggles uh, throughout the country. Um, and when I put together my, uh, my last book, Conversations About Beauty with Ordinary Americans, I put Gus's interview front and center because it really was most important to me. And what Gus uh, talked about and what his tactics were always all about uh, was placing beauty or placing aesthetics uh, uh, front and center in any kind of uh, political agenda. Um, and I want to read you a portion of what he had to say um, about his experiences working in South Boston uh, around uh, Dudley Street. He writes, um, or says, aesthetics turned out to be the best organizing tool in community building in blighted communities across the country. I'll give you two examples. Uh, on Dudley Street, the people decided that we want to get all this illegal dumping out of here and to clean up these um, uh, lots. Um, they tried to get the city to respond because people kept bringing in all this illegal dumping, but they wouldn't. So when Ray Flynn, who had claimed he wanted to be mayor of the neighborhoods, was running for re-election, they came up with a scheme to go down to his campaign office and say, we want to work for you, Mr. Mayor. And they picked up about a thousand bumper stickers. 
uh, and a lot of people dumping illegal debris would also park cars that would die right in these streets. So they took the bumper stickers and put them on everything that was dead and caused blight. And they called the television. Uh, the TV came out and took pictures of all this, and here's Ray Flynn's signs on all of them. Yeah. His campaign hurried up and responded. He created a hotline and he says, quote, Jesus Christ, these people cleaned up all that crap out there, out there. And he began to cite people doing illegal acts to prevent this kind of dumping in, uh, from happening. And then the community said, now bring some trucks down here so we can clean out all this stuff and grow wildflowers until we can determine what we want to put in these lots. Um, so for Gus Newport, uh, building unity, um, uh, building commonality, uh, building uh, solidarity uh, based on these things uh, are of fundamental importance, even though all the experts are telling him and telling these communities that the first thing you need is jobs. Yeah, that's not the way he goes about uh, building uh, his, his political movements. Um, and so uh, this, all of this had a pretty significant influence on me. Um, I want to go back a little bit and talk about some of my own experiences. Um, I was a student at Cornell University during the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, we took over a number of buildings. Um, the uh, African-American students took over the uh, student union. And after threats uh, coming from the community uh, and possibly from other parts of the university, death threats, uh, they decided to, uh, after long deliberations, they decided to arm themselves while they were in the building. Uh, negotiations continued for a couple of days. Uh, they won uh, their major demands. And when they emerged from the building, uh, they were holding uh, rifles with bullets. Um, in bandoliers on their chests. It made front page of every single uh, newspaper and magazine in the United States uh, at the time. And uh, I wasn't in the building, but I was on the periphery trying to uh, uh, give support and, and to protect the students on the inside. So, you know, very deeply involved in, in uh, campus activism. Um, at the same time, I was taking English classes. Uh, I was taking a class in the Romantic Poets, uh, the British Romantic Poets, all of whom, at a young age at least, were strong supporters of the French Revolution. And doing that in England in that time and that, uh, in that day was very risky, uh, very dangerous. You could be thrown into prison for that. Uh, uh, and yet they, um, uh, they expressed themselves. And we as students, we, all we wanted to do was make some connections between, you know, what we were reading um, and these poets and what we were experiencing in our own lives. We were forbidden from doing that because the way literature was taught back then was you had to stick to the language, stick to the text itself. It was called the new criticism. You couldn't go outside the text. You couldn't ask questions about the author's life. You couldn't ask questions about the reader's experiences. Um, you just couldn't go outside the text. You couldn't ask about historical con a historical context was given, but it wasn't really seen as crucial to understanding text. Enormously frustrating for us. Enormously frustrating. Um, and that's one of the reasons why my generation um, really opened up literary criticism, um, literary study to a whole range of theories and methodologies and approaches. And so that within 20 years or so, you could ask, and, and you did ask just about any question you could think of, of literature in the classroom. Uh, there was uh, structuralism, there was deconstruction, there was uh, historicism, uh, there was psychoanalytic criticism, feminist criticism, Marxist criticism, uh, queer theory. Uh, and so it was explosive and it was enormously liberating. Um, but there were still problems, uh, problems for aesthetic experience and problems for uh, judgment. Because one of the um, developments was to really pay a whole lot of attention to uh, uh, the literary canon as a hierarchy, that is to say privileged texts, and the focus was always on the texts that were excluded from that canon. And the effort was always to bring in these texts, to pay attention to these texts. And all of this uh, was based upon very uh, deep going skepticism about uh, 
the people, and they were all white men, who made the determinations about what great literature was and which literature got into the anthologies. So there's a lot of bitterness uh, directed against these people and their judgments. Um, and so instead of making different kinds of judgments and uh, advocating for different kinds of anthologies and hierarchies, if you will, a lot of attention was paid really to the politics of the text. Uh, and, and value was often assigned to the ideological or political outlook of the text. And there was much less attention paid to craft, to skill, to the aesthetics of the text, to uh, your own pleasure uh, in reading the text. And so beauty, in a way, was um, uh, you know, really discarded. Um, diminished um, uh, during these uh, during these years, and I I found that enormously frustrating because, as political as I was, and you know, as radical as as I was in my political views, I never thought that um, the, the pleasure that we get from art or from reading literature. Um, and recognizing beauty and judging beauty and assessing beauty was in any way inimical to our political goals and shouldn't uh, be separated from our political movements or from our academic um, impulses and, um, and, and, and efforts. But it was. It was. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to do something about it. Um, I didn't know exactly what. I had just completed my first book, Renewing the Left, uh, which is about the New York intellectuals. The subtitle is Politics, Imagination, and the New York Intellectuals. New York Intellectuals, very powerful group in the 20th century, arguably the most powerful group of intellectuals in the United States, uh, maybe except for the uh, transcendentalists of the 19th century. And they fought, um, I think, a very heroic battle against Stalinism, against proletarian literature, against judging literature uh, by using a litmus test of ideological purity. And they were much more interested in aesthetic achievement, aesthetic accomplishment, aesthetic complexity, because they were champions of, uh, of modernist literature at a time when modernism was not part of the literary canon. And they were responsible for canonizing many of the uh, great modernist writers of the 20th century. Um, so um, I... Um, I was already kind of predisposed to, uh, to being skeptical of discounting beauty uh, as having a role in political struggle. Um, uh, it's about that time that I read the article in The Nation on Gus Newport, and I thought long and hard, uh, had conversations with colleagues, and I thought maybe, you know, the best way to make my case is not to uh, offer one more theoretical argument, but rather to go to the people, to go off campus and, talk, and, and find out how ordinary people in their own regular lives uh, experience beauty or have aesthetic experiences. And I spent the next several years interviewing people doing oral history. Um, I, I, I spoke with about 15 different people, uh, all of them, almost all of them from Syracuse. Gus Newport's not from Syracuse, he's from Rochester, but just about everybody else was from Syracuse. Uh, a guy who fix, fixed up old cars, uh, uh, women who knit um, and own a, owned a knitting store, uh, a labor organizer, the head of a local choir, a dancer at Adult World, several uh, store clerks, um, and um, I asked them uh, some of the following questions. Um, you know, what is it in your life that gives you uh, aesthetic pleasure? Describe your aesthetic experiences to me. Uh, and they all had aesthetic experiences. I, I kind of chose them at random, but not, not completely at random. Uh, and they all talked about the arts or the crafts that they were really into uh, that really made a big impact on their lives. I asked them, well, okay, what, describe what that feeling is like when you're in the moment. You know, what is the physical sensation? Um, you know, how, how, are you, how are you feeling? Uh, and they did that. 
And I asked them, well, what prepared you for these experiences? Uh, what in your life uh, mo moved you in the direction to, to, be, uh, accept to, to, to have uh, access to these uh, uh, feelings? Uh, did any, anybody or anything cultivate your, your, your taste to, to be attracted to these things? And, and, and I also asked them about the effects of these experiences. Um, the political effects. Um, do, do these experiences tend to isolate you? Do you tend to experience them alone? Or does it tend to, do these experiences tend to uh, bring you into uh, communication with other people, into some sort of collectivity? Does it, do, does it impel you to want to get involved in civic uh, or social issues? Or the opposite? Does it make you a better person? Um, does it make you a more moral person? Does it help you empathize with others? Um, and then I also ask them uh, whether these can be likened to spiritual or even religious experiences. Um, and uh, uh, the answers, the myriad answers to all of these questions, um, I was hoping would address some of the uh, um, immediate, but also perennial questions about aesthetics that have been asked uh, uh, for time in memoriam, all the way in the Western tradition, all the way back to Plato. Um, and I want to touch on some of these issues. Um, those of you who are familiar with Plato will know that when he uh, described his ideal utopian community, the Republic, he banished the poets. No poets allowed. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, he had two main reasons for that. He felt that poets were uh, three removes from the truth because poets were reproducing what other people reproduced, uh, reproducing a reproduction, essentially. Um, and the other thing was that, they, uh, that was that the poets encouraged irrationality, that they watered the passions um, and... Um, uh, uh, and, and Plato attributed effeminate uh, characteristics to art for those reasons. So, so poetry was dangerous. You don't want the soldiers who are defending your city-state uh, to be weeping uh, over the uh, fate of their uh, comrade in arms. You, you, you need them to be stoical. You need them to be strong to protect the rest of the people. This was, this was some of the thinking. And then, of course, in many respects, uh, the vast majority of us, even today, are still uh, um, platonic in our, in our understanding of judgment, of assessment of art. All of us who go to see a movie or read a book and we come back and complain that um, the way women were represented was not accurate, um, you know, uh, it's racially backward, or uh, if it's a movie, let's say, about baseball, the baseball scenes didn't seem very realistic. They were not mimetic, in other words. They didn't reproduce reality, didn't reproduce the truth. So, so platonic ideas are extremely important uh, still and influential in our society today. And so, uh, you know, I ask people about these kinds of questions. Um, Aristotle, uh, it's, it's generally thought, uh, uh, provided a rejoinder to uh, Plato in his Poetics, where he argues it really defends art, defends tragedy, when he talks about this notion of catharsis. Uh, he, it's, it's, it's the one word that has drawn by far more attention from literary critics uh, over, the, uh, over the centuries than any other. Uh, and, and he really never completely defines it. Uh, we don't know whether it's a medical term or a religious term or, or not. But the way I read uh, the poetics, at least, is that um, the audience goes into the theater, and, and in watching tragedy, they, um, they feel pity and they feel fear uh, because of what the protagonist has, uh, has experienced. And they have these powerful emotions while they're sitting in the theater. Uh, and that very experience purges them of those emotions. That's the catharsis that take pl takes place during the experience of art. And by the time they walk out of the theater and re-enter society, re-enter the civil world of the city-state, they are in a much more harmonious and balanced state. Um, they've learned some things, and they are able to judge things in, uh, with a great deal more equipoise than they would have been able to uh, otherwise. And so, you know, I think 
from my point of view, that's uh, Aristotle's contribution. That's his defense, and I think it's a pretty effective defense of what happens when you encounter art or, uh, or literature. I'm going to skip over uh, Kant and Schiller uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, because of time considerations. Let me just say that they also, uh, in, in, in important ways, have had an influence on me because they consider uh, aesthetic judgment to uh, be powerful assets to um, uh, really a precondition of political liberty. Um, I, won't, I won't go any further because it gets pretty complicated. Um, another uh, thinker, a contemporary literary critic by the name of Elaine Scarry, wrote a book about 20 years ago called On Beauty and Being Just. And I found that my investigations confirmed a lot of her speculations. I wouldn't say conclusions. These are sort of because she doesn't provide any really any empirical evidence to support her claims. But she makes, uh, I think, many arguments that my limited empirical evidence confirmed. And that is that we, when we encounter beauty, this it's not an experience that excludes. It's an experience that includes, because when we experience something that's beautiful, we want more of it. We look for more. We encourage more examples of it to become visible, and we also encourage others to visit those other uh, examples of beauty. And so that's really an example of what she calls replication. So literally, uh, beauty causes replication replication because we tend to um, uh, marry or make love to people we consider attractive, and that actually replicates the species oftentimes, okay? Um, so she's talking about that, but she's obviously also talking about art objects, um, and we want to replicate them. We want to replicate them ourselves if we can by creating our own art, and we want to replicate it by encouraging others to have similar experiences. And therefore, the distribution of these experiences is an important factor here. And she talks about these experiences as experiences of reciprocity, that uh, we are not just passive um, uh, viewers of art or literature, but um, that those art objects elicit responses from us. Uh, and they are not static or uh, or unmoving either. We help create meaning. There's a reciprocal relationship between the art object and the viewer or the audience. Uh, and there is ideally mutual respect going on there, a mutual uh, uh, dynamic. Um, and uh, that dynamic represents fairness to Elaine Scarry because uh, when we view um, uh, something we consider beautiful, we want to dwell on it. We want to learn from it. We want to understand it. Uh, we want to be fair to it. Um, and again, that's a, an example of, uh, of, of fairness for her. And it also uh, provides us an example of what she calls uh, the symmetry of everyone's relationship to another. Uh, that we have this powerful, uh, symmetrical relationship with the art object when we're deeply involved in it, when we're moved by it, and when we pay very close attention to it, when we're alert to all of its subtleties. And that's usually what the aesthetic experience is all about. We pay attention uh, with more energy and alacrity than we do uh, with m almost anything else in our experiences. And then finally, um, you know, uh, Rawls, uh, John Rawls, who is uh, arguably the most influential political philosopher of the 20th century, um, even though he's hardly known in the humanities. Um, I'm assuming that you know something uh, about him. Uh, and I write about how his, um, his understanding of justice, justice as fairness, or his theory of justice, actually has some interesting aesthetic components to it, even though one critic once referred to him as the least aesthetic philosopher that they know of. Um, and so I, I was going to read uh, a chunk of this, but uh, I don't really want to go more than, what, 45 minutes here? And I've gone over a half an hour. Um, so... Well, let me just say this. How many of you are familiar with Rawls? 
Okay. So, um, so, so, so he, he premises, uh, I guess, his whole theory on our ability to kind of um, wear a veil of ignorance in the beginning, the, the original position, to imagine ourselves in a position where we are not going to be, uh, uh, we're going to forget about our own aspects of our own identities, okay? Race, class, gender, uh, we're going to try to put all, all of that aside. OK, um, and we're going to try to be as objective and fair minded about uh, uh, how to develop principles of justice as we can, uh, the veil of ignorance. And I argue here that that very much resembles uh, what can happen and I would argue should happen when we encounter a work of literature or a work of art, that at least we should be willing to temporarily suspend our own values and our own judgments and accept the world that the author or the artist uh, creates for us, jump into that world, experience it in a state of relative freedom because we really have no obligations uh, to carry out anything that we're reading about or viewing. Uh, we can just dive in uh, and live in that world for a while. Um, this goes against the grain of much contemporary literary theory, which wants to, and, I, and the word is all, often used, interrogate the text. Okay, this is, in a way, not the opposite, but it's really delaying those kinds of judgments. Um, it's being willing to uh, surrender to that world temporarily and then emerge from that world back into the real world and assess what you've just experienced. And how much of what you've just experienced do you want to retain? How much of it do you want to reject? But at least give yourself the chance to live in that world for a while. So that's kind of what I say about Rawls. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. I okay. agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, you know, I'll just mention in passing Habermas's uh, theory of communicative action. There's a very powerful aesthetic dimension to that. For him, aesthetics is indispensable to any political, liberating political movement or, uh, or, or humane society that we want to build. And that's consistent with his socialist, uh, Marxist and socialist perspective. Um, and um, now I want to turn uh, in the few minutes remaining to some practical applications of all of this. Um, <clears throat> how might this work in, in the world, in, in the real world? I mean, it works in the world of uh, individual private citizens, but how might it work in the um, civic world uh, where people are uh, conflicted, uh, where they're uh, disagreeing, and where their conflicts need to be resolved? <clears throat> um, and I, uh, I'm going to be drawing from uh, Doris Summer's book, The Work of Art in the World, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's very practical oriented, but it also has an interesting theoretical underpinning. The Work of Art in the World, the very title, uh, is a riff on Dewey. And I didn't mention Dewey, and I should have mentioned Dewey, but I don't have time to mention Dewey. Uh, the Work of Art in the World. So normally we think of this phrase, the work of art. The work of art is the art object, but that's not what she means, and that, that's not what Dewey means. The real work of art is the work that art does in and through experience in the world. That's what she means, and that's what Dewey means by work. And that's what I'm talking about, really. Um, so uh, she talks, uh, <clears throat> she has some, uh, she describes uh, Antonas Makas, who uh, was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia. Um, when that city was considered one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Uh, um, homicide rates were through the roof. Uh, traffic uh, accidents uh, were uh, prolific. Uh, very a whole range of problems. She, she, she taught at Harvard. <clears throat> and um, um, she, um, she asked the president of Harvard when she had a meeting with Lawrence Summers, uh, no relation. Her name is Summer. That's Lawrence Summer. You know, uh, to, ha, ha, to figure out how to get him interested in and supportive of the humanities. And she asked him, if you uh, were mayor of a city like Bogota, what would you do? And he had no answer. 
And so she, then she described what the mayor actually did. And what he did was he used art uh, to completely reshape the culture of that city. Uh, he referred to it as urban acupuncture. Um, so he hired pantomimes. Um, <clears throat> he referred to this as mime over matter. Uh, pantomimes to uh, artists to go to intersections, crosswalks, uh, and direct traffic uh, throughout the city. Um, he uh, hired uh, artists to paint 1,500 uh, stars uh, on streets and on sidewalks and in crosswalks to remind people of traffic fatalities and pedestrian fatalities all over the city. He had these mock vaccinations against violence. Uh, he had uh, sociability nights in which only women were encouraged to go out to the restaurants and the clubs so that they could feel safe. Uh, a whole list of other things. And um, within a couple of years, the statistics uh, told a completely different story for that city. They had essentially solved their uh, problem of crime, solved the problem of traffic fatal fatalities, uh, and some of the other uh, antisocial problems that the city faced. Um, so he really kind of saw the city as a classroom. That's the, that's the way he he himself put it. And so uh, you know, in my profession, in in uh, in English, our professional organization is the Modern Language Association, which has between twenty thousand and thirty thousand members. Um, <clears throat> I think for the uh, uh, if the Modern Language Association were to commit itself to uh, aggressively intervening in the public sphere and trying to introduce art and aesthetics into public conversation, it would do a great deal to lift uh, the level of public conversation in this country. Uh, I see no reason why uh, the MLA doesn't have its own uh, syndicated radio show or even own a radio station in this country. Um, I see no reason why uh, there can't be a concerted effort to intervene online Online, it's a leviathan these days. It's ugly. And there is, to my knowledge, no concerted professional effort to intervene and push back against the um, uh, demagoguery, against the invective, uh, and against the polarization that, uh, that shapes public discourse increasingly in the United States today. Um, you know, and certainly whenever it comes to public events, civic meetings, town halls, um, I think that art can play an important role. I think that if you begin these meetings with uh, some sort of performance, some sort of uh, reading of poetry, um, oftentimes they're begun with prayer, but that's, and that's in many respects functions the same way. Um, you know, at least it's, it tries to put people in mind of larger concerns and what they may have in common. But I think art and literature can play um, a very similar role. So just to sum up, um, I think uh, I'm trying to argue that encounters with beauty encourage imagination and justice, uh, uh, excuse me, imagination and judgment. Uh, it enables fresh perceptions. It fosters new agreements between and among people. And it allows us to fight back um, um, against uh, this um, uh, poisonous uh, uh, public uh, discourse that, uh, that is growing with uh, charmed and shared moments of freely felt pleasure. Thank you.